Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lorna Nove. I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. And I'd like to welcome you to what will be a very profound and informative and really quite enlightening event exploring the history of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and its aftermath. Before we begin, I'd like to invite everybody to join us next week on March 31st at 6 p.m. for an event exploring the film In the Heights. We're gonna be joined by Samson Jacobson, who is location manager and HGC board member on Hell Ion as they talk about how the movie came to, into being, about scouting in the area and how the film is a wonderful celebration of the vitality of the life up in, in the Heights. So please join us, go to our website, hgc.org to register and find out more. So tonight we are thrilled and honored to have two wonderful guests. Lisa Ackerman is on the Board of Advisors of the Historic Districts Council, and she serves as Executive Director of the Columbus Citizens Foundation, which is an organization devoted to Italian culture and Italian American heritage. She was interim CEO of World Monuments in 2018 and 2019. Before that, she served as executive vice president of the Samuel Crest Foundation and worked in the education department of the Museum of Modern Art. She's chair of the Historic House Trust of New York City and of the New York Preservation Archive Project. She has served on the boards of so many organizations, including Partners of Sacred Spaces and the Neighborhood Preservation Center. She is a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute where she also received her MS in historic preservation. Um, she also got an MBA from NYU and a BA from Middlebury College. And we're honored also to have Gina Polara, who is currently working with Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, which will be erecting a permanent public memorial to those who died that will be placed on the facade of the building where the fire took place. She previously oversaw the construction of the Louis Kahn designed FDR Memorial uh, for, Freedom's, for Freedom State Park on Roosevelt Island and is now working to renovate the Eleanor Roosevelt Memorial in the United Nations Garden. She's a graduate of Cooper Union and she's proud to say that at Cooper Union's Great Hall hosted many of the raucous meetings where advocates passionately fought for workers' rights. Before we begin, I just wanted to tell you that you can enter your questions into the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So now I'd like to hand it over both to Gina and to Lisa. Thanks so much, Lorna. I'm gonna be very brief because we're gonna to get to Gina uh, as the main event. But um, before Gina launches into um, kind of the official presentation, I hope she'll tell us a little bit about what piqued her interest to get involved with the Triangle Shirtwaist shirt Factory uh, Fire Memorial. And also, you know, it's a complex story and it's one of those things we think we know a lot about, but I think Jean is going to enlighten us that there are a lot of details that we may not understand. And I think one of the things that we may not understand um, is that, you know, the, the fire perhaps was one of those predictable events that for the decade before the fire, there'd been a growing um, workers movement and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union actually was started in 1900. And so um, we may not realize just how old that union was. And um, as it grew over the course of time, it became one of the largest workers unions in the United States. And we often may think that it's the United Auto Workers or the AFL-CIO that was the largest. And so to think about how forceful the garment industry once was in the United States, that it had uh, a union with 450,000 members. Okay. Um, and in those years leading up to the terrible events in 1911, I, you know, I think one of the interesting things is um, we may not realize how old um, the workers union movement was. And we also, we think of that as a area that was poor immigrants sports, slaving yeah. away in these sweatshops, which was of course true, but that even in 1900 and 1910, 
they were a large enough force that they had a voice. Um, it wasn't a voice that was as fully listened to as it should have been, but um, nonetheless, I think that really one of the most important takeaways from remembering the fire is understanding that there was already um, a very strong consciousness that um, you know this was a problem that needed to be solved. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gina. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And I wanna thank um, Lorna Nove and Lisa Ackerman for inviting me to come talk to you about the Triangle Fire on this several days away from the 111th anniversary of the fire. Um, Lisa asked how I got involved with this, and um, uh, I got involved through a, a Cooper grad who asked if I would um, come and advise the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition about um, how one can get something built in New York City. So the coalition is a all volunteer group of people who have been dedicated to this cause now for over 10 years. Um, they, they were formed in 2012. They were, they were informally formed to uh, plan for the 100th anniversary in 2011, and then thought this is a really good opportunity to make us into a formal organization to, to really push to get this long overdue memorial made. So I guess I've become the memorial person somehow. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but um, so the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire was our nation's worst workplace disaster until 9-11. So that stood for 90 years. Um, and you may be asking yourself, how, uh, you may be asking yourself, what is a shirtwaist? And this is an example. Um, so a shirtwaist was a ready to wear, inexpensive blouse that was modeled originally after a man's shirt. So prior to the invention of the shirtwaist, women wore a one piece dress. And this allowed them to, to the freedom to wear a shirt and a, and a skirt rather than one piece. So it gave them a little more flexibility and a little more movement. Um, it was also mass produced. So it was inexpensive. And it really became the symbol of the independent working woman uh, as it was these women who were actually making these garments. At the turn of the 20th century, um, production was hyper competitive. In Manhattan alone, there were 450 factories employing almost 400,000 workers. Many of them were young immigrants. So a factory floor at this time would look something like this. This was considered modern by the, that day's standards. It had windows, it had light, it had air. But you'll notice how crammed the workers are onto the floor. So they tried to maximize the floor space to get in as many workers as they possibly could. And you'll notice that these are long tables. There's no break in the tables. So you have to go down that long path if you want to circulate around the floor. And, and that, as you can imagine, became a problem um, when the fire struck. So as Lisa mentioned, there was a lot of unionizing going on around this time. And in 1909, the workers of the Triangle Factory actually went out on strike. That catalyzed a larger strike that almost all factory workers participated in. And it became known as the uprising of the 20,000 because so many people participated in it. And as a result, um, this strike, they, were, they actually earned some uh, workers' rights. So they got a shorter work week, 
52 weeks. They had four paid vacation holiday days and they had got higher wages. So prior to this, the fact the triangle factory workers were making, uh, were working six days a week, 12 to 16 hours a day. So they, and in, in spite of the fact that many factories after this uprising of the 20,000 gave these concessions to the workers, the, tri the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory did not allow the union to come to their factory workers. Um, many of the uh, strike women were Jewish as is evidenced by the banner that's in Yiddish behind this line of ladies here. Um, and let me just give you now, uh, orient you to the location of where the, what was then called the Ash Building was located, is located. So it sits here east of Washington Square Park at the intersection of Washington Place and Green Street. A lot of people think that the building actually did not survive the fire, but it does exist. Um, it is now called the Brown Building and it's owned by NYU. It houses their biology and chemistry labs. So this is a photograph of um, the building as it would have appeared in 1911. Um, it's a 10 story building and the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied the upper floors, the upper three floors. So they, they were on the eighth floor, the ninth floor and the 10th floor. And I just want to call your attention to the signage that's hanging off the corner of the building. I don't want that um, because I'm gonna make reference to that later. So, the Triangle um, Shirtwaist Factory was the largest manufacturers of shirtwaists. They could employ up to a thousand people um, when they're in a very busy season. The day of the fire, there were about 500 people working on those three floors. So on Saturday, March 25th, at about 4.40 p.m., a fire broke out on the eighth floor. And this is a cutaway of the eighth floor showing at that number one that the fire broke out there. Um, no one really knows the exact cause of the fire, but they believe um, it was due to a match or a cigarette or a cigar that had been thrown into a bin of fabric scraps. And because there was so much fabric and so much material and, and flammable uh, things in the building, the fire spread very quickly. And there's also a lot of dust that gets in the air when you're cutting fabrics and that dust makes the, the fire really spread. So the fire, as you see this arrow here, the number two was drawn towards the air shaft in the back, likely because there was a window open. Um, and so the people on the eighth floor called up to the 10th floor, which is where the owner's offices were to say that there was a fire. Now in these factories, they had buckets of water that would hang around the sides, the side walls, and they tried to put out the fire. They threw 27 buckets of water on the fire and it didn't extinguish the fire. So the people on the eighth floor using the stairs and the elevators and the fire escape went down out of the building. The people on the 10th floor that knew about the fire used the ladder and climbed up and out to the roof. So they were helped ferried across the parapets of the roof by the neighboring NYU law students. So the people on the 10th floor were able to get out. And then at this point, the people on the ninth floor really didn't know there was a fire until they started seeing the flames coming up the side of the building. And they were essentially trapped at that point. Um, because the fire had grown in intensity and they were using the, the elevators and the stair, trying to use the stair on the Washington Place side of the building that would bring them out onto Washington Place. But that door to that stair was locked. So the owners of the factory you know, denied that the door was locked, but 
the door was locked um, and it was locked because they didn't want factory workers stealing scraps of fabric from the factory. In fact, at the end of every workday, every worker had to open her purse and turn out her pockets to show that she wasn't taking anything home. Um, they also locked the door to keep out union organizers and to stop the possibility of spontaneous walkouts. So the elevators were really the primary route for survivors. Um, there were two heroic elevator men who went up and down as fast as they could getting out as many people. The elevators really only held 15 people, but they crammed 30 people into each of them. And it's they think that they saved 150 people of the people that survived the fire that day. Unfortunately, for the other people who could not get on the elevator, they either perished on the ninth floor in the fire or they jumped from the ninth floor windows. So the fire department came very quickly. Oh, I wanted to show you um, just to give you an idea of how cramped these fire exits were. This is the stair that led to the Washington Place exit. This stair is two feet, nine inches wide, which is why the doors to these stairs opened inwards, not into the stairwell, but into the factory, which made it very difficult for the people on the eighth floor to get out because so many people were pushing towards the door, they couldn't actually get the door open. Uh, I also wanna show you the fire escape that collapsed under the weight of people trying to get out, completely undersized. Um, this collapsed and two dozen people were killed when that collapsed. So the firemen arrive at the scene, they come, they come with their fire hoses, they come with their ladders. And if you can see this middle, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but if you can see the middle, um, in the middle here, there's a, a fire ladder and the ladders only reached to the sixth floor of the building. So they got their nets and blankets and tried to uh, capture the people who were jumping from the ninth floor. But the weight of the bodies, many of the girls held hands and jumped together. And the weight of all of the people jumping together, they just smashed right through the sidewalk. Um, and so, this is the scene that people came upon that day um, as they heard all the commotion. Many people came to see what was happening. Um, the, there were 146 people that died in the fire. Most of them were young women, Jewish and Italian immigrants. Two thirds of them were Jewish, a third were Italian. Um, some of the girls were as young as 14. Um, there were 129 women that died and 17 men that died in the fire. Um, so the bodies were taken to what was then called the Charities Pier, which is at the foot of 26th Street and the East River. So they brought all of the bodies in coffins to the pier where the families would come to try to identify their family member. In many cases, they could only identify them by a shoe or a ribbon. Um, they were so disfigured. Um, so in a little less than 30 minutes, 146 people were dead. And this was the scene at the Charities Pier um, where these family members had to file past all of these bodies to try to find their person. And this is what the ninth floor looked like after the fire was put out. So we'll take a little break here, um, I think. Oh. You know, I, um, uh, let me turn my 
camera back on, apologies. I, um, you know, it's such a gruesome event and it's, it's hard to think of it as anything but a tragedy. Um, it, it, you know, the legacy is not only the tragic side of it, but the legacy that it was so tragic that it forced very immediate action. And so, you know, a, a couple of things that I wanted to point out that I know you'll be illuminating us about in, in the next section of the talk, but, you know, the, the buildings of that era, um, you know, solid masonry, um, very well constructed, often very over engineered because, you know, they, they were, they understood they were being used for factories and the weight of machinery and all. So it was a very modern building by the standards of the day. And, you know, I, ironically, you know, the, the building is still there today. So the, the building in a lot of ways fulfilled its promise of being um, a fire resistant building. Right, it was considered fireproof in its day. It was right. And so, but, you know, it's, it's like many fires we could cite where you can't account for, you know, human error and um, irresponsible behavior. So uh, a cigarette uh, or a cigar or hot ashes going onto fabric. I mean, you know, and even with them pouring so much water, I mean, as you describe the amount of fabric, the fabric fibers that were in the air, I mean, this was just something that kept smoldering because there was always an adjacent piece of fabric to catch fire. So, you know, you, you can imagine the horror of the people on that floor realizing that the fire was going to be out of control. And you mentioned the elevator operators and, you know, we, we kind of forget that the miracle of a building like that having an elevator but it actually needed somebody to move that elevator. So it's not today where we press a button and the elevator just comes and the doors open. So this was a really a heroic effort on their parts to keep those elevators going. I think, you know, one of the other interesting things is you mentioned, um, you know, the walkouts of um, 1909 and the 20,000 people. And it was sort of estimated at that time that that was 20,000 of about 35,000 people who were in you know, this profession. So it was a very high percentage of the employees who did that walkout. One of the interesting things about the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory is that during that walkout, they locked out their employees. So, I mean, they, they were aware of the mounting problems and, you know, rather than be responsive as some of the other companies were, they, they kind of continued in their efforts to run something that didn't necessarily have the safest of conditions. And not and, only that, Lisa, they actually hired thugs and prostitutes to beat up the people who were picketing. Yeah, which is horrendous. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and I, uh, and, you know, they, they seemed, as you mentioned, they really wanted to keep union organizers out. Um, and so the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory before the fire was already a kind of example of what the workers movement was trying to point out as, you know, some of the worst offenders. Um, I, you know, I think one of the other things, and I know we're about to get to this, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, is that out of this terrible tragedy, there was immediate action. And um, Governor Smith in New York and President Roosevelt commented on the fire and the need to protect workers. There was already a growing movement of very wealthy women in New York who were um, behind the women and you know, calling for better conditions. But in a way, the kind of miracle is the fire was in March and by October, we had new fire laws on the books. Um, and I think one of the amazing thing is a lot of the fire laws that we live with today stem directly from the 1911 change in the law. So this was really a very pivotal moment. And so on, you know, the ashes of this fire and the loss of so many lives, there was, I don't want to say a good outcome because no tragedy ever has a good outcome, but there was you know, a positive movement in the right direction. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to you to take us through this next section. Sure. So in the aftermath of the fire, 
there were many um, funeral pr processions and there were many just mourners out marching around in support. Um, there was a funeral procession organized for the unidentified dead um, and more than 100,000 workers participated in that. There was also uh, a solemn parade, if you want to call it that, where over 400,000 spectators stood in the rain to kind of watch these empty, these hearses with these empty coffins uh, roll through the city. Um, and this was also the aftermath. This is Francis Perkins on the left and Eleanor Roosevelt on the right. So Francis Perkins was having tea at a friend's house on Washington Square the day of the fire. She, hearing the commotion, went to the corner, saw what was happening, saw this horrific scene of these young girls jumping to their deaths. And she said that was the day the New Deal was born. And she went on to become President Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor and the first woman cabinet member, member ever. And she's really responsible for, um, she was also appointed to the factory investigating committee that was organized directly after the fire. Um, but her work on that investigating committee, she really took with her when she went to the White House. And so there's direct uh, a direct result of the fire in the fire codes that were changed. But there's also some indirect in that uh, Frances Perkins was responsible for creating the social, the, the work, labor work hours and other things related to working conditions. She was also instrumental in, you know, the, the setting up the social safety net and all of the programs that um, were established under the Roosevelt administration. She was a very pivotal figure in all of that. Um, so they did create a factory investigating committee and New York City and New York State became leaders in the nation in passing uh, laws to keep workers safe. So among those, they required automatic sprinklers. There were no sprinklers in the Triangle factory. Um, there were stricter requirements for fire escapes. The doors on exit routes had to swing outwards, not inwards. They were had to install fire alarms. There needed to be exit signs. They had to practice fire drills. They set standards for proper ventilation, lighting, elevator operation, other sanitary measures, uh, and they established maximum occupancy limits based on the number and availability of emergency exits and buildings. So these are all laws that we continue to benefit from today. And it was really through the work of all of that pressure from those union labor organizers that made this possible for all of us today. Um, and a lot of the older people in the audience may remember this. There used to be more of us in the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, but a lot of our jobs have disappeared. A lot of the clothes Americans are buying for women and kids are imports. They're being made in foreign places. When the work's done here, we can support our families and pay our taxes and buy the things other Americans make. That's what it means when the label says union. Look for the union label when you are buying Michael's dress for balls. Remember somewhere our union sewing, our wages go. So 
I so just, Tina, want... I'm, I'm just going to stop you for one second. Sure. You, know, sure, you sure. said the older members in the audience. <laughs> and when we were first talking about having this event and you played that, I thought to myself, I haven't heard that in like 40 <laughs> years. I mean, and yet when the soon as I heard it, I thought, gee, I remember as a kid and in high school, seeing that commercial all the time and exactly. hearing it and you, and you, you forget how much this used to mean. And so, I mean, I, you know, life changes, workforces evolve, there are a lot of changes, but as I said at the very beginning, I think we just have forgotten how forceful the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was here in the United States. And I think we've forgotten just how much um, all manufacturing, but clothing manufacturing in particular, um, you know, I mean, I was in high school in the 1970s and that's probably the last time I heard, you know, that commercial and, and all of that. So it's, you know, you, you we kind of forget sometimes how important this was. and. Um, and it's really kind of a testament to life evolves. I mean, you, you don't forget it on purpose, but you know, there was a time we all would have known that uh, commercial and that song and, and I, you know, and the importance of looking for those labels because it, it meant something. It meant more than just made in the United States. It really meant we were supporting our, you know, our fellow, family members, friends, et cetera, who worked in this sector. So um, just a reminder that, um, that, you know, New York was once a very, very important manufacturing epicenter as well. Exactly, and I show this uh, photograph. Um, these are some people who are having, you know, striking against the factory conditions and, calling everyone's attention to the Rana Plaza disaster that happened in 2012, where 1,176 people died in a, in a garment factory collapse. But what's so fascinating about this too is that they, they are evoking the Triangle Fire as well. So it's, it's a something, it's an event that continues to resonate around the world. And now, you know, with the export of all of our manufacturing going offshore, that problem, those problems of the factories and the factory work conditions have only just gone someplace else. Unfortunately, they haven't disappeared. It's just been like our manufacturing, it's just gone overseas. So Lisa, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to um, no, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to, to have this program was um, not, I mean, we want to remember the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, and we want to remember those who perished, and we want to remember that their legacy um, is the changes in the fire law that we still embrace. But I think importantly, what you've put on the table for us is that um, just because the clothing manufacturing has moved offshore, it doesn't mean the problems are gone. So, you know, the collapse, um, you know, in this factory that's represented in this photo, somebody wrote into the chat about the London residential fire a number of years ago, where the building was wrapped in a flammable material. I mean, we're still fighting many of the same life safety issues. And so, um, you know, we're smarter theoretically today because we have the knowledge of the past and we know how to manipul manipulate materials. But, um, but, you know, there are often still cost cutting measures and other activities that put people in peril. And I think one of the other interesting things is that the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire is known in other places and known as an important element in workers' rights. Um, so I, you know, I think that the memorial um, that will go on the building and will be a very, very important local monument for us. It's also an international symbol. I mean, people understand the story and its importance. And, um, and it doesn't really matter that we don't manufacture much clothing in the United States anymore. Whoever is making the clothing in whatever part of the world deserves dignity and deserves safe working conditions. So um, the legacy in a lot of ways is um, this is a universal story with universal problems. And, um, and we remember it 
um, because it's not um, it's not entirely gone as a set of problems for us to solve. So I, I know you're going to tell us about the memorial and um, and what uh, you know what the aspirations for the memorial are. But also there's an annual celebration um, and it's coming up on Friday. So um, I mean I know that people can go to the coalition's website and learn more about the activities. Um, do you want to take us into that discussion a little bit? Sure, I can tell you, um, you know, what, what we do to celebrate the Triangle Fire today. Um, Ruth Sergal, who was one of the founders of the, remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, started a chalking project. So um, you can select the name of someone who perished in the fire and go to the place where she lived. Many of them are obviously on the Lower East Side. Um, there are a couple of outliers, a few in Harlem, one near my neighborhood on the East Side in the 20s. And you can chalk the name of this person, how old they were when they died and that they died in the factory fire. And people do this around the time of the commemoration. Um, so if you go on the coalition's website, there are there is information on a lot of other events that take place around this time, but they do do an annual commemoration. Uh, last year and this year it was virtual, but they lay a wreath at the corner. They have some speakers. They bring in a fire truck. It raises its ladder to the sixth floor to demonstrate that those fire trucks were not able, the ladders were not able to reach the victims. And then they lay a white carnation as they read the name of every person that perished in the fire. So that will take place online. And again, that information's on the coalition's website. Um, this is a picture from the, the 100th anniversary. They made a shirt waist for each person that died in the fire and they usually bring those out for various events. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit now about the memorial that um, we are in the process of fabricating. Um, this was chosen, um, there, there was an international competition held in 2013. Um, it was judged by a panel of architects, uh, fashion designers, and, and, and other people, some people from NYU who owns the building. Um, and this was the winning entry. It was called Reframing the Sky, designed by Uri Wegman, who is a Cooper grad, which is how I got involved with the project, and his design partner, Richard June Yu. Um, so it is essentially a uh, textured stainless steel ribbon that begins at the ninth floor, which is where most of the people jumped from. It cascades vertically down the corner of the building and then it splits along the east and south elevations to become that flat horizontal panel that you see. And it wraps around and then this lower piece is a reflective band that's made with this incredibly um, crazy material called stone glass, which is a, a new, a fairly new material that's a fusion of glass and stone and it's super durable. Um, and effectively they were with this ribbon design kind of calling on the tradition of hanging mourning ribbons or bunting on public buildings to mourn a loss. So their stainless steel ribbon both is a nod to that and a nod to sort of the needle trades and, the, and garment workers. So this is a rendering of what you'll see. It's a little bit difficult to see, but it does come down and it splits around the corner. It shows this reflective panel. Um, and in that panel will be etched a line of text that is um, various testimonies from witnesses who saw the fire that day. And as you see above that in this horizontal panel will be 
laser cut through that stainless steel panel, the name and age of every victim in the fire. So when you look down into that reflective panel, you will see the name um, reflected back towards you. Um, I wanna call your attention to the, the, the um, texture of the stainless steel ribbon. So a really wonderful thing that these two designers incorporated into this design, partly in response to the many conversations that have been had recently about you know, who makes memorials, who are they for, who are we memorializing? And they really wanted to have the public um, have an opportunity to participate in creating this memorial. So they called uh, this the Collective Ribbon Project. And we actually um, asked people to bring a piece of fabric and to sew it onto a long Muslim ribbon that is the same length as, the, as will be the final ribbon. And then the texture will be trans acid etched onto the stainless steel ribbon. So there's a detail, um, there's a texture to that ribbon that has some meaning to it. And a lot of people, these are obviously women from the unions, but we held a workshop, um, FIT gave us their auditorium and we had these long tables of all these women sewing, which oddly, you know, was very reminiscent of women sewing at these long tables back in the factory. Um, but I think it's a really beautiful um, addition to the meaning of this memorial. I um, stitched uh, a couple pieces of fabric, one, to, one for my um, Italian grandmother, who was a garment factory worker, and one for my uh, maternal grandmother, who was a seamstress who made handmade clothing for all of her 16 grandchildren. So... That was, it's a very meaningful. And all of these um, pieces of fabric have been documented, the location, who stitched them on, what their story was the meaning, and that will all be kept at the Kiel Center in Cornell uh, University that also keeps the archives on the Triangle Fire. So they've agreed to do that. Um, and this is what you, what you will see when you look up the corner of the building. And I just want you to remember the signs that hung on the corner of the building back in 1911. So that's also calling those to mind. And you see here how the uh, ribbon turns and then you see the names cut through those panels. So we put a full scale, we, we built a full scale mock-up and we put it out on the site one day um, to test whether we were gonna need some other kind of lighting at night. So this was to remain up during the day into the night. And you can see, this is, this is what you will see when you look down into the reflective panel. You will see the names cut out and you see the sky visible beyond the names so that the names kind of live in the sky. And what was really uncanny and unexpected was the night that we put this up, a storm blew in and the clouds became almost reminiscent and evocative of the smoke from the fire of that day. So I think that this memorial is gonna be a very moving tribute. Um, what also happens because you have something that you're looking down at and something you're looking up at is that you're, in a way forced to replicate the motion of the people who witnessed the people jumping to their death. So there's a lot of um, poetry and nuance to this memorial that when it gets built, will finally mark this very important place that currently has three undistinguishable plaques on the building. People walk by and they don't even know it's there. And they're always asking, you know, 
is the, where is the Triangle Fire Building? So this will really call attention to it in a very special way. And we were lucky enough um, to have uh, the Italian Minister for Equal Opportunities and Family come to the memorial site yesterday. And Richard Junyu, one of the designers, is um, that person standing on the left. So she was very interested. So we have a lot of interest from a lot of parties that understand the historic significance of this and the fact that it's still so relevant to today. So I'm going to put up the um, web address for the coalition, which you can visit and learn more about um, the activities that are going on around the 25th anniversary. You can sign up for the virtual program. There's another program that's being held on the um, evening of the 24th with the folks being a museum. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways to participate um, if you're so interested and thank you all for coming. And I guess I can look at the chat and see. Yeah, so we've had a lot of moving comments. Um, people who remember the International Ladies Worker Garment Workers Union um, uh, <laughs> song and commercial, but also one person wrote in that, you know, she, she had an aunt in the, um, International Lady Garment Workers Union and uh, her grandfather was a Sicilian immigrant. And, you know, I mean, I, I think this story would touch me no matter what, but I mean, I have to say on my mother's side of the family, I mean, my, my uh, mother's family was immigrants from Sicily. And while most of the men ended up being masons and construction workers, um, you know, my grandmother and her siblings worked in a garment factory, not in New York City, but in Patterson, New Jersey. And, um, so, you know, I think a lot of us, um, while the people who perished in the fire were um, Jewish and Italian uh, immigrant women, um, you know, a, a lot of us, no matter what the immigrant story is, I mean, in my case, I do connect to the Italian immigrant story, but, you know, I think we all understand that um, we may not realize the peril some of our um, ancestors were in when they came to this country. And, you know, we enjoy the benefits of the risks they took, not only in leaving their country and coming here, but, um, you know, often taking jobs that, you know, you'd think being a seamstress wouldn't be a dangerous job. But as you pointed out, long hours, subpar conditions, locked doors. I mean, I think the other tragedy in the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory is that there were fire hoses, but they were um, very inadequate and in Absolutely. poor working condition. The valve that controlled the water was rusted um, and couldn't be moved. So they were dependent on the buckets you talked about. I mean, you know, we could have hours and hours of discussion about um, uh, many elements of this story. But I, I think what you've really put on the table for us is there's a reason to remember this for the tragedy of the past, but also to inform us about the world we live in today, and also the fact that the building does exist today. So there's an opportunity um, to have a very visceral memorial where it's not just a plaque on a random building, but this is really, in a lot of ways, a way to bring the story to life. Um, and oh, I um, wanted to, to I should add one thing. So the owners, Isaac Harris and Max Blank, they were charged with manslaughter and they were acquitted. Um, then there was some civil suits brought against them. And in 1918, they paid families $75 for each person that died. Um, and they actually collected $60,000 more than what the fire caused in damages from their insurance company. So they, um, and they continued to flout the law. Uh, I think it was only months later that um, they were fined for having a locked door in the factory, in another factory. So these, these things continue to happen. So there are two questions in addition to the very um, poetic comments we've been getting about your presentation and how important this is. 
Um, one is when is the more memorial expected to be inaugurated? And the other is, um, did the company survive? And the, the company did survive the fire. They ultimately did not survive the workers union efforts and um, the real uh, strong legislative push to create um, better working conditions. Um, you know, I, I mean, you, you hate to besmirch the name of anybody, but they, they really um, were running a sweatshop in the worst possible way. And they, they just were beyond reform. So eventually that put them out of business. Yes. Um, Gina, do you want to answer about when we can expect to yes. stand um, on the street and see the memorial? Exactly. We are targeting, dedicating it next March 25th to celebrate the 112th anniversary of the fire. So we've got a few things that need to happen before then, uh, but we are in fabrication. Um, NYU just did an enormous amount of work on their sidewalk and the sidewalk vaults underneath the sidewalk. Um, that work had to be done before we could get on the building. So we are teed up to uh, get on the building once the memorial is entirely fabricated. It's being fab fabricated offsite, upstate in Gardner, New York. Um, so that all of the elements will be brought and then uh, installed, affixed to the building. Oh, well, thank God it's being manufactured in New York after our discussion. <laughs> and um, By a union I, shop, by a union shop. And I'm going to answer the last question about what happened to the International Lady Garmers Work at Union. So in 1969, they had about 450,000 um, members. But, you know, as manufacturing waned in the United States, um, they ultimately formed another union um, called Unite, and then they formed yet another union called Unite Here that brought under the same umbrella the garment workers um, and what I'll loosely call the hospitality industry, restaurant workers and uh, hotel employees. Um, and certainly in the 1990s, that union still had about 250,000 um, people. So the, you know, our relationship in the United States to unions is complicated. Um, so, you know, union representation has gotten smaller over the years, but the, the legacy of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union um, still exists. Um, and and there, go ahead, Gina. There are very active um, union organizers. Um, and I see that the unions are potentially making a great resurgence. You know, Starbucks has pushed to unionize. Amazon continues its fight to unionize. Um, you know, and for all of its imperfections, there is something to be said for, uh, you know, large groups advocating for themselves. You've got a larger voice, the more people you have. So um, I think that that bodes well for the future of the yeah and I think um you know for in the academic world um many universities have seen graduate student assistance and um you know junior faculty bond together in unions yes. because of um you know the way uh especially graduate student assistants um really had few rights and few benefits yet they were um you know working full-time jobs in many instances. So I agree with you, unions um, serve a very important purpose and there are professions that would not be um, well protected if they didn't have a union behind them. And, um, and we're seeing unions pop up in unexpected places like universities and museums and, um, yes. and places where there have been, you know, often a long tradition of low paying jobs. So, um, and, uh, and uh, I were getting some, you know, uh, verification from faculty about adjuncts as well. So um, I'm mindful that it's almost seven o'clock and we want people to enjoy their evening. And um, so Gina, thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, thank Laura, you. I'm gonna turn thank it back you all over for to you coming. for the final goodbye. Thank you. I wanna thank Michelle Arbelou also for working behind the scenes to make this all happen tonight. Gina Pallara, Lisa Ackerman, thank you so, so much. I don't think there's a dry eye in the house. <laughs>
And thank well, thank you. you all. Thank you all for joining and have a lovely evening. And I want everybody to know that this will be posted to the HGC's YouTube channel tomorrow so that if you want to watch it again or share it with others, please do so. And on our YouTube channel, you'll see recordings of so many of our programming. So we want to share that with you. And we hope to see you all on March 31st for our In the Heights event. Thanks, everyone. A much everybody. more cheerful event than ours. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.